Um, okay, so I don't have like a cold open or anything set up for this particular episode. Um, so can I show y'all a hidden talent I have? Check it out. There's nothing written on my hands, nothing on my sleeve or anything. Uh, I'll get the camera here. Uh, just let me unclick that. Come on. Oh, come on. Don't be difficult. There. Let, um, just, there's nothing, like, on the walls or anything. Nothing on the ceiling. There's nothing, like, behind me over here. Um, there's nothing on the table, really, to uh, show anything. Just, there's nothing around me. Just, oh, God. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we're gonna have to do a cut. What you're gonna see here is 100% me, okay? I promise. I'm not cheating you here. Suck it in, suck it in, suck it in. If you're into to in around Berlin, make a desperate move or else you'll win. And then begin to see what you're doing to me. This MTV is not for free. It's OPC, it's killing me. So desperately I'll sing to thee of love. Show but also rage and hate and pain and fear of self. And I can't keep these feelings on the shelf. I tried. Well, no doubt I lied. Could be financial suicide, but I got too much pride inside to hide or slide. I'll do as I'll decide and let it ride till I die. And only then shall I abide this tide of catchy little tunes of hip three minute ditties. I wanna bust all your balloons, I wanna burn all of your cities to the ground! I found I will not mess around unless I play, and hey, I would go on all day, but when I say I have a prayer to pray, that's really all this was. When I'm feeling stuck and need a buck, I don't rely on luck, because the HOLE bring you back! I ain't telling you no lie! Oh, man. <laughs> oh, just, just being able to do that was like 90% of the reason I wanted to do this episode. Shit. So, yeah, I actually decided to put this particular episode in the producer's poll, and frankly, I'm kind of shocked this was the song that ended up winning, given that I put it up against the likes of Enter Sandman, Proud Mary, Freaking smells like teen spirit, really? Th this is the one? Well, it barely eked its way to victory, so... Hey, I'm totally okay with that, because... How often do you get the chance to talk about Blues Traveler? Yeah, Traveler. They are one of those bands that just... Kinda got swept away from the public consciousness, didn't they? They started out as one of the quirkier acts in the whole jam band scene that started blossoming around the early 90s. You know, guys like Fish, Bella Fleck and the Flecktones, Dave Matthews Band, Spin Doctors to a lesser extent. Uh, you know, that general scene. They broke out into the mainstream around 1994 with their huge selling record 4, hit the Billboard Top 100, played SNL, won a Grammy, became one of the bigger names in rock for like just a teensy weensy little moment and then we kind of just forgot all about them. Well, no, that's not entirely true. It's not like these guys were a one-hit wonder or anything. Nah, man, they're two-hit wonders. Mm. Well, again, that's debatable, okay? It's totally debatable. Depending on what you define as a hit, you could argue these guys don't fit into that category, but man, to me, they've always felt like one of those bands that's totally a two-hit wonder. You know, that's not something you see every day. And you know, credit where it's due, it is so much harder to be a two-hit wonder than it is to be a one-hit wonder. I mean, any dumb lump of protoplasm can be in the right place at the right time and make it happen once. Gerardo, Hinder, whatever the fuck this thing was, uh, uh, I, 
fuck all of you for making this a hit. I I'm just saying, random jackasses land in the one-hit wonder spot all the time. To be a two-hit wonder, you need a little something extra. It's just a teensy bit more respectable, you know? You weren't just a random ass fluke. You genuinely had enough in your tanks to give you a, at least a little bit of clout. You went somewhere. Even if it wasn't terribly far, it sure as hell was a lot farther than the likes of, you know, D4L, Elvis, this thing, I... Uh, why do I know this exists? Uh, anyway, Blues Traveler would totally fit into that two-hit wonder category. Their first, arguably more notable song, being their first big hit from that same album, Run Around. While I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about that song in particular, I will say that, yeah, Run Around is pretty banger too. Nothing else in the 90s really sounded like this. I think it's what helped give Blues Traveler a bit of an edge when they first went mainstream. The song's got a nice, upbeat, bouncy vibe to it. Popper's flexing a bit of that gigantic vocal range he has, and that harmonica solo. I can understand why this became a hit, especially in 94, the era of Gin Blossoms, Counting Crows, Collective Soul and the like. This is part of that burgeoning adult contemporary rock scene that was just starting to develop only like on steroids. God damn, listen to them. I also understand why the video for this song got big too. It's another thing that was just completely running rampant over the 90s. Cynical disaffected irony. This vid's just chock full of the stuff. Uh, there's this cool, hip, sexy young band on stage putting on a banging ass concert and looking cool and hot and hip and in the background, tucked behind a dark, dank, miserable little curtain, is the actual band that's doing all the work. And they're completely being ignored and pushed aside and tucked away because not sexy and fun and hot. Oh, man. Uh, this video even has the characters from The Wizard of Oz showing up to pull back the curtain and show us everything is just bullshit. I mean... If this metaphor were wearing lead gloves, it wouldn't be any more heavy handed. The irony thing, it was just all over the goddamn 90s. Like, I was there. I just remember absolutely every goddamn buddy doing it. Cobain was arguably the king of it. He was at least the guy making it cool enough for everyone else to do it. But I mean, pretty much every grunge and punk band was doing it in one capacity or another. I mean, hell, even Goddamn U2 was doing it. You Goddamn 2 was rolling their eyes and running around going, Psh, rock stars, am I right? Ugh, I just can't even. I just can't even. I'm Bono and I just can't even. This is a terrible impression. I'm just saying, people, if you freaking too could get away with that, then Blues Traveler totally could too. And this album in particular, you can just really feel the snideness on it, man. It's just, mm. Now, this is only speculation, but I mean, I can almost guarantee you they had to have had that conversation with their label at least once that went something like, yeah, 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 you guys can play really good. You're hot shit, but what can we do with you? You guys aren't marketable enough. And I mean, at the risk of sounding like the biggest asshole in the world, from a basic understanding of what gets big in popular music, yeah, they totally aren't. Not to disrespect them, but they look like a bunch of scraggly ass hippies with a guy who looks like Andy Milanakis doing Fat Elvis cosplay on vocals. I'm just 
saying, you know, say what you want to about Dave Matthews. At least that guy gives you something to work with. These dudes, well, it's a good thing they can play. And you know, you can totally see their label being all, you know, shifty and shady about their look and their image. They really tend to shy away from them in their music videos. I mean, the runaround video literally throws them in a closet so that they can focus on a band that's more photogenic. All of their music videos up to this point had a real Ann Wilson in the 80s thing going on. They really did everything in their power to focus on anything else outside of the band that was actually making the music, you know? With the exception of their very first music video in 1990, but... Wow, people in 1990 really had no clue what they were doing, did they? And you know, again, I'm just speculating here, but I can almost guarantee you it probably got to them. It had to at some point. All these big wig industry guys who've never written a song in their life all telling them, Oh, you're not pretty enough. You're not marketable enough. Me, me, me. Well, this for marketable, you f The melody is so simple and instantly infectious, you just seem to have the chords memorized the instant you hear them. It's uncanny. There's something about it that's comfortably familiar, huh? It just works. And John Popper's voice. John is a big guy with a big register and a great big room shaking bellow. He just hits you with every single ounce of it too. But I've seen nothing so far. He's selling it so goddamn good on this track. If this were a pro wrestling match, he'd be selling like Ric Flair in the 80s. <laughs> You may not even know what he's singing about, but goddamn, whatever it is, his conviction just draws you in. Hook, line, and sinker. Ha! Every single note, every single stanza feels deliberate and purposeful. The song almost feels perfectly constructed. Mm. That's because it's a trick. Hmm? Oh yeah, it's a trick. It's a trick everybody falls for. Over and over and over again. One of the easiest tricks in the book. I've fallen for it, you've fallen for it, everyone's fallen for it at some point or another. People, let me introduce you to a little guy called Taco Bell. I mean, Paco Bell. Is it weird that I totally wrote this line just so I could make that joke? Looks like this run to the border is tax deductible. <laughs> I'm terrible, why do y'all watch me? Johann Paco Bell was a noted German Baroque composer in the mid to late 17th century. He happened to write a little ditty simply called Paco Bell's Canon in D. And it's actually not anything too terribly complicated, truth be told. It's a simple progression of eight relatively general chords. This thing is pretty easy to pick up no matter what instrument you're playing it on. But believe me when I tell you that you totally have heard this song before. Yes, you have. Shut up. I don't care what you're into. I don't care how eclectic you think your tastes are. You've heard this song before. Well, actually. Well, actually, these nuts. You've heard this song before, especially if you're into rock. I mean, this little thing has been sprinkled all over the ages, from the classic stuff like The Who and The Beatles. Pictures of Lily, help me sleep at night. There are places I remember. To later legends like Bowie and Ozzy. Goodbye to all the 
It was all over the 80s. And the 90s. Do you have the time to listen to me whine? So Sally can wait. She I'm just saying, everybody has used this hook in one way or another. Everybody. 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 And people, I do mean everybody. Normal's not a language that I ever learned to speak. What? You didn't think I knew what I was doing when I was doing that? I knew exactly what I was doing when I was doing that. <laughs> I'm a piece of shit. So yeah, this little riff right here, this riff gets around for about 300 years or so. But hey, it's worked upwards of three centuries. There's got to be something to it, right? Like I say, it's a simple, easy hook that gets people drawn in. You know, if you just kind of need to punch out quick and get something wrapped up, early for the day. Paco Bell's Cannon is a great technique to use. It's a very common device in the music industry. But that's the thing. The Paco Bell trick has been used and abused and done to death so much over the years. When you do catch it out there in the wild, it can feel cheap and cynical. There's this old as hell YouTube video out there, a fair amount of you have probably caught this at one point or another, called Paco Bell Rant by Rob Paravonia. If you haven't seen it, just pause the video and give it a watch, it's only like five minutes, but he nails down goddamn perfectly how the Paco Bell trick has been used and arguably abused in pop music over the years. Oh hey, what do you know? There's our boys right there. <laughs> Using Paco Bell's canon in a pop song, it can feel really hacky. Or at the very least, it can seem tacky and unoriginal. But what I love about Blues Traveler's use of Paco Bell in this song is that it's not a cop-out. This is the exact opposite of a cop-out. This choice is 100% deliberate. Like I said, it's a trick. And they are literally using it as a trick, but they're letting you in on the trick. They're showing you how the trick works. It's like one of those behind the magic specials from back in the day where they would show you some amazing magic trick, but then walk you through it step by step to show you precisely how they pulled it off. This song is basically just that. It's like one great big deconstruction of pop music in and of itself. Paco Bell was chosen as sort of a catalyst to get things rolling. And one look at the lyrics will show you their technique at work. It doesn't matter what I say As long as I sing with inflection First verse, dead center, right up front. The very first thing he has to say is that everything I'm saying doesn't matter. It makes you feel It doesn't. He could be singing about any goddamn thing. It doesn't matter. As long as he sounds like he means what he's saying, he could be singing about any goddamn thing in the world. And he ain't wrong. Again, he's selling this 1,000% and it works. <gasps> the gravitas with which he sings draws you in from the very first note. Even though he flat out tells you you shouldn't be listening to him because he has nothing to say. But I think nothing so far. And I'm a keep it up. 
There's disaffected irony, and then there's just raising two middle fingers into the air and walking backwards straight into hell. This is the latter. In case that wasn't clear. This guy has had an entire verse, and he hasn't said a goddamn thing yet. And he's downright proud of it, no less. He knows he doesn't have to say a goddamn thing, because if he just fakes it with enough sincerity, chances are, yeah, you'll still buy it. If I'm doing my job, it's your resolve, I break. So, so, so many other pop acts out there do this and get away with it every day. And you know what? He can get away with it too, because he knows exactly what he's doing. And hey, even if he doesn't. And if you thought the first verse was just some kind of setup, just some kind of building tactic, some kind of structural sort of thing to help lure you in and now there's gonna be like a big wake up sheeple kind of moment to break you out of your disaffected state, you know, make you understand that you really should be paying attention. I am being insincere. Nope, he just doubles down. Hell, he even tells you that his next line is going to be a mixed metaphor that doesn't make any goddamn sense in an attempt to confuse you. And that's exactly what he does. No matter how much Peter loved her, what made the pan refuse to grow. That is one of those lines that is like, Halfway there, you could, with a little more effort, kind of structure that into meaning something. It's certainly a good setup for something. It's one of those things that you could almost get tricked into thinking it has a deeper meaning, which I love to death because that's such clever and brilliant writing. What does John actually connect this line to? <laughs> The hook brings you back. It's a dad pun. It's a dad pun. That entire setup was used to throw a dad pun at you. Fuck you, John, I love it. But again, it's a perfect reinforcement of his point. He doesn't have to be saying a goddamn thing in order to get and keep your attention. He just has to sound like he's saying something. All he has to do is utilize the tools of emotion. He doesn't actually need to build anything with them, he just needs to wave them around enough to convince you he's working. I've known guys on construction sites who get away with that same trick. Believe me, it works in music too, weirdly enough. If he can just effectively sell you the idea that he's got something to say, and he's got you, man. And he is selling like a motherfucker in this song. I mean, just listen to this harmonica solo. Like, God damn, Popper is to harmonica what Neil Peart is to drums. How do you even get that good, man? But still, two thirds of the way into this song and even though the man has openly and unabashedly admitted to gleefully wasting your time, chances are by this point you are just completely hooked on it. Ha! Okay, this, this isn't like a running gag, I promise, I'll stop. It's a song that in its own playful, if not cheekily sinister way, reminds us of the grim truth we often don't like to face up to when talking about popular music. Lyrics aren't necessarily that important. Don't get me wrong, do not get me wrong, people. Good lyrics are the linchpin to any great classic song that lasts the test of time, and it's always a thousand times better for a song to 
have good lyrics than to not have them. I'm not saying that lyrical content is completely unimportant, it's not. If you want to be the best of the best, you have to have at least some focus on what you're talking about. Lyrics can be very important to that process. But if all you want is just some cheap and easy success, eh, halfway try to write a good tune, that's enough. I mean, it's true, guys. Search your feelings, you know it to be true. And yes, it's true of a lot of the more garbage acts out there. You know, your Nickelbacks, your Imagine Dragons. Sure, they almost take pride in how inane their lyrical content is. But, I mean, let's get real here. How many good and even great songs have absolutely terrible lyrics? Like, okay, for example, nobody in their right mind is gonna tell you that Van Halen isn't one of the greatest rock bands of all time, including me, Van Halen fucking rules people, but even at their best. I mean, come on. Hell, Red Hot Chili Peppers are one of my personal favorite bands, but my favorite song out of their entire catalog of theirs contains this. Fucking deep, man. Fuck, I'm the guy known for spending hours and hours ranting about how Blue Album and Pinkerton are some of the best albums of the 90s. But have you listened to the Sweater song recently? This fucking thing is one of the hallmarks of my childhood, and it sounds like Ralph goddamn Wiggum wrote it. That probably explains more about me than I'm comfortable with, but I'm just saying, y'all get the idea. The message behind a song isn't exactly everything. And if you aren't paying close attention to an artist, if they have a good enough hook, they could slide any old thing underneath you. <laughs> like anything at all. It's actually kind of scary when you think about it. Hell, with the right melody, you could find yourself absolutely bopping to a song that encourages stalking or a song that's really, really chauvinistic or a song that's just racist as hell. It's so racist. Or even... Yeah, looking back on everything that's happened over the last three years, was I being too harsh on dystopia now? I'm just saying, the ability to utilize a hook is a very, very powerful tool. A lot like a real hook. If you utilize it properly, you can get a lot of work done with it. But if you're careless... Ow! Oh God! Oh! The guys, they know that here, and they're showing you exactly how the trick works by walking you through it, almost step by step. They're flat out showing you the answers that are in the back of the textbooks of popular songwriting. We're through the looking glass here, people. And the bridge is probably the part of this song that's the most brilliant. The rapid fire, assault on your senses, jibber jabbery, nonstop, Barrage of liberty blah, just blah. This is where the song really starts to fuck your shit. This single part of the song is on that same level as We Didn't Start the Fire or It's the End of the World as We Know It. And honestly, it's even using a lot of the same tactics those songs do. It's sensory overload. Rin Tin Tin or Anne Boleyn? What do either of those things have to do with sucking? 
Do I make a move or else I'll win? Wait, why wouldn't I want to win? And what am I making a move to? Sam TV is not for free. So PC is killing me. Well, okay, I'm not even slightly prepared to have the politically correct conversation or whatever, right? Dude, I'm still on Rin Tin Tin. Can you slow the fuck down? And yeah, the first half of this barrage, at least, all of it is nonsense. Believe me, none of this means shit. But like the Peter Pan quote analogy from earlier on in the song, a lot of these phrases are meaningless statements that could trick you into thinking there's meaning behind them if you're either paying too little or too much attention potentially. It's the appearance of sounding deep without any actual depth. It's the musical equivalent to those cool sidewalk paintings you see on Instagram. It's cool to observe at like first glance, but you know, the slightest step to one side or the other. Oh. Perspective makes a big difference, people. Again, it's all a trick. It's all a facade. Popper and company are laying out what the recording industry does to you every single day. And it can be a little disquieting when you take a moment to step back and kind of analyze it. It's like, man, there's no way I'm this gullible, am I? Not, I can't be that gullible. Yes, you can, even you. It's a song that's meant to get into your headspace and really fuck with things a bit. It's meant to get in there and rearrange the furniture to where you don't even recognize the place anymore. And it can make you feel small and insecure and kind of vulnerable. Or at least it feels that way until they finally give you the big reveal. About halfway through this assault of calculated, premeditated nonsense, Popper finally, almost as an act of mercy, shows us his hand. I've tried, well no in fact I lied, you're thinking I do suicide, but I got too much pride to try to hide, or side, I'll do it on the side, and then it's right, and it'll die, and only then try, but I'm trying to catch a new tune, I've hit three minute ditties, hold about three balloons, I wanna burn all of the ditties to the ground. He flat out admits it, yeah. I'm bullshitting you all here. I do not mean this. I am lying. But it's because this isn't who I really am. In fact, I hate doing this to you. This isn't me. This isn't us. This isn't what our band is supposed to be. And this isn't who we want to be at all. Remember what I said earlier about the guys coming under pressure for not being marketable enough? Well... The guys don't seem to enjoy this fact any more than you probably do. They don't want to be like that. This song is a rally cry against shallow manipulative marketing tactics that uses shallow manipulative marketing tactics as a weapon against themselves. And the guys just totally fess everything up to you. After an entire song of snideness, of disaffection, they actually stop to show you a vulnerable, real, honest moment. They say that even if it's not what people want, even if it's not what their labels want, even if it is financial suicide that could potentially kill their career, they don't care. They're willing to take that chance because they don't want to be something they're not. They don't want to be dishonest. They don't want to deceive you. In fact, they want to do just the opposite. They want to bust all your balloons in the hopes that you'll see that there's more to life than just the pretty balloons people hold in your face. It's a manipulative song, yes. And like I said earlier, it's just super concentrated 90s ironic snark, but I feel like ultimately the song does have a positive message to it. It's not insulting you for falling for all the tricks they've laid out for you. It's just kind of saying, hey man, you see what I did just there to you? That whole shtick that I did? Like that could happen to anybody, and it often does happen to anybody, so hey, 
maybe just be a little careful out there. You know, it's deceptive, it's sneaky, it's almost diabolical in what it does. But the best part about it is, is that it actually works. It worked on me at least. Remember the opening bit where I recited the whole bridge verbatim from memory? Like this, suck it in, suck it in, suck it in. If you're into dinner and Berlin, make a desperate move or else you win and then begin to see what you're doing to me. This MDB is not for free. So PC is killing me so desperately. I'll sing day of love, sure, but also rage and hate and pain and fear yourself. And I can keep these feelings on the shelf. I try, but no doubt I like can be financial suicide. But I got too much brain inside to hide. Or slide, I'll do all the side. Let it ride to life down. Only then shall I buy this. I can catch a little I three minute ditties. I want to bust all your balloons. I want to burn all of your cities to the ground. I found I will not mess around unless I play. And hey, I would go on all day when I save a bread of bread. It's really awesome. But feeling stuck in need to bucket down a line luck because the hook brings you back. Remember that in case you happen to forget. I've had that bridge, and by proxy the entire song, memorized since I was nine years old. The song came out in 1994. It's 25 years old, and it's been stuck in my memory this entire time. There's so many more other more valuable things I could devote that brain space to, but it's never left my mind. All these years, it's been stuck in there. And when I first memorized it, I didn't have any fucking clue what he was talking about. Like pretty much everyone else at the time, the hook brought me back. It brought me back over and over and over again for years. And for a long time, that was enough. But as I grew up and matured and learned more about how music worked and about things like human psychology and sociology, as I became a more knowledgeable person, I would always come back to this song and discover something new about it. I had no idea about the Paco Bell influence at first, but you take a few choir classes, you start learning to play a few instruments here and there, you eventually connect the dots and discover the correlation. I had no idea what the hell he was going on about with all the weird mangled metaphors and whatnot, but you know, you take a few literature classes over the years, you learn the art behind prose, phonetics, and poetry, get a few bachelor's degrees you'll never really use, <laughs> and again, I eventually discovered the correlation. I found out what he was doing. I saw the tricks at work. And the song amazed me yet again. If you want to write a good song, all you really need is a good enough melody. But if you want to write a song that actually says something, something that actually has a deeper meaning, something that has the potential to last and withstand the test of time and even grow on people and teach them new things as they develop, that takes something special. I mean, memorable hooks, memorable songs, they come and go all the time. Even really, really good hooks can just evaporate from the public consciousness and from your own mind, just like that. I mean, when was the last time you thought about artists like Gotye, KT Tungstall, Meredith Brooks, The New Radicals? Especially KT Tungstall. I miss the fuck out of her. Why did we have to let her go? She was great. What are you up to, KT? I miss you, girl. Good songs, even great songs, come and go all the time. A decent enough hook can make you the biggest thing in the world. A truly great hook. That'll stay with you for life. On that, you can rely. Suck it in, suck it in, suck it in, rent in, tin, rifle in. Suck it in with the motor, rest you in. And then begin to see what is killing me. The sympathy is not for free, and so PC's killing me. So desperately I sing to see the special thoughts. Oh, but also raging can be so bad. And I can't get these feelings off right. the shelf. I tried. Well, no effect, I lied. It's <sighs> like suicide, but I got too much pride.